Six weapons that DICE could add to the Turning Tides DLC. It's that time once again where a DLC is closing in for Battlefield 1 and DICE has yet to announce any major specifics besides the DLC's theme which is of course Amphibious Warfare and a few high level points such as potential map locations and the inclusion of the British Royal Marines faction. I sought the help of my good friend Toby Wood, he's helped me out before on these kind of videos to come up with a list of weapons that might suit the DLC considering we know very little about it at the moment. Now if you've got your own suggestions for weapons that could be added to the Turning Tides DLC then leave some comments down below today in the comments section with what those weapons are and I'll see if I can follow this video up soon with another list created by you, the community. Right then, let's get down to business. First of all, we're going to take a look at the Assault class, and Toby suggested two potential weapons here. One shotgun and one SMG. Let's go for the shotgun first. This is the Becker shotgun. Now this is a weapon invented in the very late 1890s, but it only appeared in true form in the early 1920s. So again, this is a weapon that could be spun creatively into Battlefield 1, considering it takes plenty of liberties already. Now only 100 units were made, or around 100, and what's unique about it is it's a revolver shotgun, holding 6 rounds in a revolver near the stock of the weapon. Each round would be fed into the revolver manually and could be shot again before needing to be reloaded. And we have plenty of semi-automatic shotguns in Battlefield 1 already, but one with a revolver reload style might make for some very interesting reload animations. As for the SMG, Toby has suggested the Annihilator could be an option. This is an early prototype of the Thompson machine gun, which I'm sure you're no doubt familiar with as an iconic World War II weapon used by the Americans. A lesser known fact is that the first prototype, called the Annihilator, was developed throughout the later years of World War I, and in the vision of its designer John Thompson, it was to be a trench broom to sweep through the enemy trench lines and clear them. That's exactly the same description as the Germans used for their MP18. The weapon was small, compact, and it was fit for use by just one soldier, making it perfect for those close quarter encounters. But just two days before the first crate of Annihilator weapons was due to ship to mainland Europe from the factories in the US, the armistice was signed and the war ended, meaning no Thompson SMGs saw combat in World War I. Again, however, DICE could bend the rules slightly to allow this one onto the European battlefields. Moving on swiftly now to the Medic class, and I'm going to highlight a weapon that I've showcased before here on the channel, but considering the British Royal Marines' inclusion in this DLC, I think once again we could justify this weapon making its way in. This is the British Farquhar Hill Rifle designed and developed in Britain in the early 19th century. It's a fully automatic, heavy rifle capable of firing around 700 rounds a minute and could be fitted with 20 or 65 round drum magazines. It fires the then standard 303 British round the same as the SMLE rifle and was on order in 1918 with units destined to be in the hands of soldiers in Europe in early 1919 but it suffered the same fate as the Annihilator SMG in that the end of the hostility saw it never make it to the continent, however this time in large quantities. Tests were conducted with the weapon, mounted in British planes used by spotters and on the front lines with infantry as well. However, unlike the Annihilator that went on to become the Thompson submachine gun, the Farquhar Hill rifle never went back into production or design once the war was over. The order was cancelled and the project the designers had spent nearly 10 years trying to perfect went with it. Considering the large amount of British soldiers we will see in the Turning Tides DLC, I think the Farquhar Hill Rifle will fit quite nicely and it'll offer the Medic another fully automatic option alongside the relatively new Fedorov Avtomat from the Tsar DLC. The Support class is up next and again here, like the Assault class, I have two weapons to show you that could be considered for inclusion in this DLC. First of all, let's talk about the Lewis Assault Phase Rifle. If you think it looks similar to the BAR, 
then you'd be halfway there to understanding why it was made in the first place. This is an experimental rifle, chambering the same 30 6 Springfield round that the bar uses, and it was developed in late 1918 as a direct competitor to the bar. It was also actually a whole pound lighter than the bar as well, which would have had huge bearings on which of the two rifles made it to the big time, but because it trailed the bar by a few months in development, the rifle was essentially left behind. Its designer, Isaac Lewis, was famous for developing the Lewis machine gun, a weapon preferred by the Allied forces in France, before the Americans entered the war. So perhaps him losing out to John Browning on this one with the BAR was perhaps a little bit easier to swallow. Of course, the Lewis gun is already in Battlefield 1, and it's due to receive a nice buff soon with the new weapon balance stats that we currently have on the CTE. And the second support weapon that Tony suggested that we could see in this DLC is the Darn Machine Gun. Now this is a French weapon and was mainly, like the Perino, positioned as a mounted weapon, but infantry models did exist. They featured a pistol grip and a rifle trigger below the receiver and a wooden buttstock. Most were fitted with a folding bipod as well to be used propped up in a machine gun nest or a lightweight tripod was also used. This could fit into the DLC quite easily, but as a much heavier option to the Lewis Assault Phase Rifle. It's essentially a weapon that was built a few years before and was made with a very different mindset. It depends on whether DICE is planning to have big heavy battles with large amounts of cover or whether the open waters will suit a lighter option overall for the support class. And lastly, we have the Scout class, and this is where I think we're starting to get a little bit long in the tooth about what different kinds of weapons can really be added, considering so many of the bolt-action rifles do very similar things. The only really differentiations are the amount of damage they do, and depending on what range its sweet spot's at. So, we're starting to run out of ideas here, because there's not a lot of variation. Toby suggested a nod to the Japanese forces and their role played in amphibious warfare during World War I. This is the Arasaka Type 39 rifle, first produced in 1906. It was actually a redesign of the previous Type 30 rifle, and its designer, Kajiro Nambu, reduced the numbers of parts making up the bolt of the weapon from 9 to 6, and that simplified the manufacturing process. It featured a 5 round internal magazine, but could only fire about 10 to 15 rounds a minute, which is just tremendously slow. To give you a comparison, the Lee Enfield Mark III could pull off double that rate of fire. Now since DICE has confirmed that we won't be seeing Japan make an appearance in this DLC, Andrew Galotta confirmed as much in a Twitter Q&A the other day, it would be nice to see a nod towards the Japanese forces with this rifle making it in, and as I said, they played a big role in amphibious warfare during World War I, taking some German colonies in the Far East. Now looking at some of these weapons, I think a couple of them would actually suit the fourth DLC called Apocalypse a little bit better than this one because of where they stand during World War I. A few of them that I've mentioned never actually made it to combat during World War I. We have the Lewis Assault Phase and the Annihilator SMG. I think both of those would fit into the Apocalypse DLC, which is all about prototype brutalized warfare. So having them in Turning Tides would be really cool, but potentially they'd be better off in the fourth DLC. Although, as I said, we're starting to run out of ideas of what weapons could be added, simply because some don't really fit into the combat that Battlefield 1 is offering. And there you have it, mine and Toby's list of six weapons that DICE could add to the Turning Tides DLC. Now make sure you go and follow Toby on Twitter. It's linked down in the description for you, just go and click the link and follow him. He's got some great insights into World War One weaponry, and he tends to be tweeting out all the time at weapons and things that could be added into Battlefield 1. And he makes some interesting conversations, so make sure you go and give him a follow. Let me know what you think of these choices, and as I mentioned, drop your own comments down below, and I'll try and follow this video up with a community suggested list of weapons for the Turning Tides DLC. But thank you very much for watching, and until next time, my name is Westy, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.